So welcome to Otterbank Brewery in Muff, County Donegal. A friend of ours, Declan Nixon, started Otterbank the exact same time we started Get A Brewed in 2013. He uh, did, well, Gypsy Brewing, I don't know if that's the politically correct terminology now, but it's all what brewers would commonly know up until 2019 and then got his manufacturing license here in the new premises literally just before covid just before covid yeah. day before the pubs closed Declan gets given his manufacturing license how great is that so you're stepping inside the mind of Mr Declan Nixon when you come into this premises it's an exciting area there's a lot of weird and wonderful stuff come on and check it out Okay, so once you step into the brewery, you'll see there's four fermenters here, 1100 litre fermenters. We've got a packaging tank or bright tank and another bright tank at the end. Dave Porter kit, so 1500 litre Dave Porter kit. It has a kettle over here, uh, mash tun here and water storage here. So basically mashing in, transferring from the mash to the kettle, bring it to the boil, through the plate chiller, uh, into the fermentation tank, and then you'll see as we look around, there's a lot of impressive barrels in here, ranging from ports, rums, Armagnacs, whiskies, wine, lots of really, really nice, high quality barrels. And the difference that you'll find here is, primary fermentation takes place in the stainless steel, it's then transferred to oak and the house cultures are added, which is just basically Declan's blend of bugs and bacteria. And then the aging process starts. So 18 months minimum usually uh, in relation to getting that funky complex bacteria to eat its way through the residual sugars that are left in the barrel. And they obviously allow the wort that's in the barrel, the opportunity to soak in the alcohol and the flavors for what has been in the wood previously. Okay. so. Look, when you walk around in here, you see weird and wonderful contraptions. Barrel racking cane. Um, you're going to see a lot of stuff everywhere, Declan. You're moving stuff about. <laughs> moving stuff about. But um, there's a lot of method in the madness is probably the best way of putting it. So you've got everything. Like over here, we've got really nice mezcal um, barrels ex tequila we've got a range of brandy wine port armagnac different shapes and sizes of barrels and some really really beautiful barrels um, you'll see with the nice canes around the edges um, some nice extra sort of detail on them so you can see here look it's a passion project and um, very much an independent operation family orientated there's Declan's partner, girlfriend, she fiance. I'll change that. So there's <laughs> so we've got Declan's fiance, mother, aunt, father. Granny, five Granny, yeah. Like so the one thing I want to get across from part of this visit is one, it's independently owned. It's good quality craft beer. It is aged and there's nothing rushed. There's an element of um, complexity with all of the beers. Also the handcrafted aspect of it. So we always talk about craft beer as a buzzword and um, this isn't a buzzword, this is genuinely done the hard way. So the beer is fermented in stainless, transferred to wood. It's allowed to age and develop. As it ages and develops in the wood, then it's taken through another process of secondary fermentation in the bottle. So every bottle's hand bottled, every bottle's hand capped, hand labeled. It's then placed into a secondary fermentation warm room before it reaches you guys. So whenever you're getting to taste this beer, 
it's the results of years of hard work and the, the barrels are being reused so there's a, a really distinct originality with the production process. Let's go and get a quick chat with Declan. Okay, look, you guys all know this character, Declan Nixon from Otterbank Brewing. So tell us a little bit about Otterbank. Otterbank started as a wee cookery project about, Jesus, nearly 10 years ago now. So um, I'd recently moved back from England. So I was over there working in breweries and bars and stuff. Like I'd originally gone over to do engineering, but got a job in like a brewery bar and was just fascinated by how Cascade, how Cascade worked. So off the back of that, I was going into Keynes Brewery, pestering the fucking staff there, like, you know, how do you do that? Like, how does it get fizzy? Why is it in that barrel? What's that doing? What's that there? Then started home brewing. So when I moved back to Ireland, I moved down to Dublin, uh, quickly got a job at Galway Bay. Lasted a few months, like, just didn't see eye to eye with management. I think I was a bit too late back. Looking back now, like, I could have fucking been better, like. <laughs> as soon as I left um, Galway Bay, uh, Michael at uh, Elmer Ligon Grocers there. So I uh, started with them, and then he was mad into his homebrewing again. Got back into the homebrewing, fell in with the National Homebrew Crowd. Started to take it serious. Actually bumped in, met Alex Laws of Whiplash at a wee homebrewing event. Jeez, I think it was in somebody's back garden and looking or something. Started talking to him. Um, Realised as well, he had the same sort of taste in electronic music and stuff as well. So sort of made friends with him fairly quickly. And we were sort of out one night in Dublin and we were just like, oh, we can fucking do this. We're, we're making better homebrew than this thing. We got in touch with Lazar Brew and they very kindly gave us a bit of their fermentation space. So we went down and we made Ferrami, which was like, a, we got the coffee from 3FE. And I think, oh, God bless Monica, she was one of the wee baristas there. Yeah. She sat literally for a 12 hour day pouring off espressos into a 20 litre corny like for us to add to this six and a half percent big lovely chocolate and hazelnut driven stout like. Just before that I, I, I set up Otterbank so I'd bought 200 litre plastic fermenters. My homebrew kit at the time was 150 litres. It was a big angry fucking round like a, like a brew in a bag sort of system but on a huge scale. Yeah, like plastic. I had a big winch thing that, that brought it up like. Plastic conicals that I ended up with at one stage. The, <laughs> yes, yeah, I remember. Yeah, so, remember, remember them well. But uh, literally, it, like, I'd say a week after the conicals arrived and I was all set to you know, start brewing there. Yeah. So that was our first sort of foray into professional brewing. Off the back of that, I got offered a job at White Gypsy and Alex got offered a job at Rye River. Yeah. And Jesus, for the rest, they say, is fucking brewing it's folklore true. now at this stage. I'd say it's probably better looking back now that I didn't, you know, jump two feet and start out of my property then. Because, yeah. like, I was literally a glorified home brewer, like. Uh, I was studying for the GCB at the time as well. Like, my passion, even before I'd ever even visited Belgium, like, I knew, I was like, oh my God, it's like, these are brilliant. It's not even just because they were sort of strong and that's what you would have drank at uni just to get pissed, like. It's like the depth and complexity of flavour in them. And then whenever I discovered sour beers, it's like, oh my God, it's like, this, like, you know, all your, your mind's telling you this should not be good. Because yeah. like you know yourself from sniffing the barrels earlier, like you know, a lot of them smell fucking shit. <laughs> when you taste them, they're absolutely totally gorgeous. Different. Like yeah, started to really experiment with you know different types of bugs. Started to you know what the bugs do at different, you know, adding them at different stages of the process. Yeah. So I learned a lot by dicking around. I, one of the things I like about your beer is the complexity. So like I've tried beers when we come in here, the port barrel age beer is like drinking a very complex high-end <laughs> red wine yeah. it's it's not like you've you've tasted a beer so is part of what you're doing trying to bridge the gap between beer and wine or yeah, is it funny funny to say like quite a few people have said that like their wine beers like you know especially some of like our earlier sort of releases like like well when we take a barrel in we'll always inspect it and if we can we like to get over to the source yeah. so um, we use I'd say 95% of the barrels here from one family good bridge called Quercus over in France. Lovely family to deal with, lovely business to deal with. They're, excuse me, they're passionate about what they do, yeah. which we buzz off because we're passionate about our product. Like, so I know that they're going to be inspecting the barrels over there. We haven't been able to travel obviously with COVID, but yeah. top of the list is to get over and visit them. And you know, top of their list is to come over here and see, see, see what their wood's doing as well. You know, we've exchanged wines and beers and stuff between each other. Like they're, yeah. they said the same things. Like, I was like, you know, the expression of wines here, like, is, is yeah. amazing, like, and even with the port barrels, like, you know, they arrived, like, the definition of wet, like, you know, there was a good two or three litres of port in the bottom of them, so we sort of made the decision, like, right, it'd be a shame now to fucking lose this flavour, so we let, all we did with those is emptied out the port, 
put it in fancy bottles and pretend that I bought it and give it to my family as presents. <laughs> but then the bar I we decided not to clean those bottles. Like so, the beers that we put in the port bottles in particular, that that still be you know, like there's, there's going to be a bit of port coming through. Like and you know, port has got that higher sort of alcohol, like you know, above the wine, yeah. where I think a lot of that flavour is coming back in through. Even some of the Bordeaux barrels and stuff that we used, even after cleaning, you know, we're still getting those lovely tannic sort of blackberry and yeah. red currant flavors coming through, you know, without adding any fruit. Even some of the Chardonnay bars that we use, you know, people are asking, Jesus, is there fruit in this? Like, I was like, nope, that's like all coming from the wine that used to be in it, like, yeah. Um, then I suppose on top of that, we complexity that we're getting from the high quality barrels is like, we sort of spent, Again, I suppose we were lucky in a sense that sort of COVID hit when it did. It gave us a lot of time to experiment. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, it was a wee cuckoo side project for all the years, you know, yeah. it allowed us to experiment with, you know, what does that bread do? What does this lacto do? What's the difference between them two lactose? You know, just yeah. fucking about like for years. And now we sort of spent the last two years messing about with different blends of bugs and yeasts and sacks and Norwegians and, and seeing what works well together, you know, what's going to combine together. We don't want, say, usually, you know, like one of the strains is going to overtake the other and become the dominant flavor. At the minute now, our blend, we're sort of finding it, everything's just perfect. You know, yeah. fermentation starts quickly. It, it ends, you know, and you know, after about a week, the bread character is there. You still get a really nice tarp sharpness from the lacto. So we're really happy with where our house culture is at the minute. Like, yeah. and that goes into most of our barrels as well. We're trying to establish Oh, like oh, that's an autobank beer. You know, you, there's a there's a house funk, like yeah. there's a distinguishing feature to our beers. Like, for me, right, I I love these type of beers. I love the complexity of them. But um, I want to get the message across to you guys at home. When you go in and you see one of your beers in in the shop, it's not at the standard price point, and we need to get that message across to these guys at home. There's a reason why. Like, yeah, of course. It's but like time. <clears throat> complexity age so um, you wouldn't be the most expensive doing this type of stuff by a long way but give the guys a bit of an insight into why it needs to be at that price point yeah well obviously like you know our higher alcohol beers are gonna command like a higher price point just because of you know duty and tax implications but you have to think that like you know we're not here we're not pumping out a beer every two weeks it's like when our beers get racked to wood they're staying there for a minimum of 12 months, you know. Some of our beers are like, you know, they're in there for like, you know, 18 months, two years. There's a few of the bigger barrels that were filled probably before we should have been filling them. Like, you know, the day we moved in, we, you know, we were filling barrels. Like, so yeah. the aim is like, you know, we're not, we're not pumping out beer hand over fist. Like, you know, yeah. barrels obviously cost us money. Yeah. The, our, our time costs us money. The 10 years brewing these kinds of beers, you know, is going to have an influence. But you, you do the same overheads that a normal brewery has, you, but you've got the added complexity of the turnaround time. Pretty much, man. Yeah, it's like you know, it's like as I say, like you know, it's it's liquid taking up space for you know two, three, four years. Like, and yeah. I personally wouldn't say that we're overly expensive. Like, you know, because at the end of the day, I know what it's like going into an off license, and like I fucking love say Cantillon, and that's why they pretty much the only reason I go to Brussels every year is so I can go and sit in Cantillon from opening till close and pay a fiver for a seven fifty ml bottle of amazing Atlantic. <laughs> So like even the bottles that we use, you know, they're not standard off the shelf bottles. You know, we have to specially source them in Germany, get them in. Like our label supplier we're lucky is right across the, the street there as well. You know, we try to keep stuff as local as we can. So like, yeah, there's, although our overheads are the same as a brewery, it's like, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's not your average beer going out, you know, it's a yeah. special beer. Like. There's a, an element of me likes the fact that, um, like I like the beer and I like the process that you're doing here. I'm invested in the, craft i hate that word actually but i am actually it's a word that gets bastardized yeah yeah like. but th there's a genuineness here with that and i guess maybe the guys that are watching this at home don't know your mom <laughs> your fiance your dad <laughs> no, your aunt it's like, yeah, they're, it's like, they're all in here at one stage granny whoever else doing that's part, it. and you know. it's like even in our pricing you know like i'm not taking a wage from this brewery like you know all the money that we're getting from this is being invest it back in the brewery yeah. it's like you know we're not we're lucky but we're not paying production costs if like you know if i had to hire a lot of people the beer would probably be a bit more expensive but yeah like on bottling day it's like 
I want the bottler as like, you know, my fiance Trasa is, yeah. you know, running bottles over my auntie Trisha is yeah. sitting there washing the bottles. Me, I've got my mom, my dad on the capper. My granny's even been down a few times, like, you know, making so she's like, God, I saw a bottle of your beer in the office. It's like there was a wee mark there on the bottle, you know, that doesn't look good. So I'll sure I'll come down and I'll I'll, I'll polish your bottles. I was like, <laughs> Granny, you honestly don't have to No, no, it's grand, it's grand. Yeah. So she's you know, so so it is, it's a family out of fair. And again back to that thing about price. It's like you never hear people complaining about the price of wine. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's like oh, like you know, all that beer that works out at a ten or a pint. It's like, guy, but you're not. It's not designed to be drank by the pint. Yeah. It's like you're not drinking pints of wine yeah. and complaining about the price. It's like you know, there's we're drinking pints of wine now, but that's. <laughs> 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 I think people have to get the notion out of their head that beer is cheap. Like beer isn't that cheap to produce. No, it can be, but good beer isn't. Isn't. Like, yeah. Darwin, <coughs> cheers for the beers, cheers for the My info, pleasure, cheers for the time. Always a pleasure. But guys, it's Otter Bank Brewery. I'm going to pop the links below to allow you to follow Declan on his journey. Um, there's one of a handful. I think it's a maximum of about three people doing this type of brewing in Ireland at the minute. We highly recommend you check out his beers. He's going to be launching a website real soon where you can buy directly. It is available in all good independent off licenses, so be sure to check out the beer and please let us know your feedback. Look guys, thanks so much for watching. Um, we would really appreciate it if you give us a like, a subscribe, hit the little bell so you know whenever we release new videos. It's also really important to us that you support our independent Irish craft brewers. So please follow them, show them some love, buy their beer. Until next time, happy brewing.